Right, okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, its um, it's a related work is related to the previous talk about the um, efficiency of quantum annealers and the usefulness for tackling um, complex problems. And in particular, we're thinking of problems that we uh, have to tackle as physicists. So, uh, so, so we are a group of physicists essentially, um, and uh, we we have to deal with large amounts of data. Uh, and uh, the data is, is either coming from things like the LHC, so we have connections with CERN, and also uh, things like model building. Uh, and, and it's a huge amount of data that we have to think about. And uh, we've recently turned to quantum annealers as a, as a potential uh, solution to our problems, essentially. Uh, and so what we wanted to do in this study, what we did in these papers, is uh, we, uh, we compared uh, quantum annealing as a, as a solution to, uh, to optimizations uh, in comparison with classical algorithms. And so there are various studies that have been done with the classical ones. So we're thinking of things like genetic algorithms, uh, steepest descent, and so on. And we were interested in how annealers square up to these things and how useful they could be to us uh, when we encode our problems. Uh, we expect them to have advantages over classical algorithms uh, for certain situations that we have to deal with. And uh, typically, the problems that we're thinking about uh, can be things where there are many uh, local minima, many optima that we have to find the best one of. So you can think of it as lots of local minima, and we, we need to find just the, the lowest one. Uh, and in, in the study, what we find is we compare uh, typical uh, typical heuristic classical algorithms with uh, with quantum annealing, and we do find that in many cases we can do much better than the things you might normally consider using. So the three things that we compared in this study are gradient descent, uh, null de mead, and thermal annealing. So let me just uh, sort of tell you who we are. Uh, so, so I am at Durham University, so it's the Institute for Particle Physics Phenomenology. There are three of us, so we're particle physicists, essentially, uh, particle theorists. And, uh, and also Nick Chancellor, who you'll hear from later, uh, is in our quantum computing group. And he, uh, he is the one, essentially, that started us on this journey. So uh, let, me, uh, let me talk about the, the different sorts of things we're going to compare. So the, the first uh, sort of thing that you, you might think of for finding a, a minimum is gradient descent. So it's essentially, you have some sort of landscape and you want to find a local minimum. So you just follow the gradient essentially. There, there's something else uh, which is uh, commonly used called the Nelder Mead algorithm. So we're going to compare with that. Uh, Nelder, Nelder Mead works as a kind of, uh, so what you do is you construct a simplex. So if it's a two dimensional surface, you're moving around on uh, your simplex has three points to it and the idea is you take the worst point and you reflect it but, uh, uh, you reflect it between the two other points and that way you kind of walk walk down the slope to the minimum uh, and then there are two other ones you're probably more familiar with so thermal annealing is the one where you uh, it's the equivalent to quantum annealing so it's the it's uh, you are in some minimum and you allow yourself to jump between minima uh, with a Boltzmann weighting uh, with the temperature and you reduce the temperature. And the idea is that if you arrange things correctly, you'll end up in the global minimum. And then there's quantum annealing and quantum annealing. Uh, what you do is you, you induce quantum tunneling in the system. So that's the idea. Of course, the problem is to encode the landscape. So a lot of what I'll talk about is actually how do we how do we put a landscape onto the annealer? It's not such an easy thing to do. You have an Ising model; it's really a, a sort of quadratic model. We'd like to be able to uh, encode something which is more complicated, which has got lots of minima. So that will be a lot of the problem that we have to think about. Right. Okay. So uh, to begin with, and uh, so so this study, incidentally, it's entirely in two dimensions. It can be expanded to three dimensions. Of course, the limit is going to be the number of qubits that we have to use. But anyway, uh, so we're going to we're going to begin in two dimensions. And the first thing that we wanted to do in this study is to really uh, understand the physical properties 
in two dimensions. And, uh, and so as we have an Isaac model, the natural thing to do is to see, does it behave like a two-dimensional Isaac model if we encode it as a two-dimensional system? And so, uh, so as, in, as we, we learn in kindergarten, a two-dimensional Isaac model has a, a phase transition. So we'd like to be able to see if the quantum system also displays a phase transition if we encode an Isaac model. So at the top is, uh, is the basic object we've got, which is a generalized Isaac model. And so the couplings are JIJ and HI. So if you've ever played on the D-Wave, any of that, you will know what these things are. Um, and, uh, and you add to this thing the transverse field uh, term, which induces hops between the, uh, between the uh, minima in the uh, Hamiltonian of the first term. So the, the sigma z spins uh, are, are where you will put your minima, encode your landscape. The sigma x uh, will induce hopping. So uh, the tunneling rate in this system will go like uh, this exponential, e to the minus square root of the energy difference. And we can compare that with a, a thermal annealing uh, system. So there it's a Boltzmann suppressed uh, hopping. So it's e to the minus, and then the, it's delta e over t, where t is the temperature, so you would be reducing the temperature. Uh, actually, so strangely, uh, it's, you, would, you would think that what you want to do is dial down a, in order to do your annealing and compare it with the Isaac model, the easiest thing for you to do actually is to dial down the kind of overall scaling of the Hamiltonian. So you want to, if you scale down your, and, and you'll, you'll see, you see that in the, in the exponential, there's the delta E. So, so we're gonna scale down delta E and we're gonna treat one over square root lambda as being equivalent to temperature in the Boltzmann uh, factors of the, of the thermal anneal. Um, so let's see how they compare. Okay, so we're going to look at the Ising model uh, quickly. Uh, so, uh, so this is encoding the basic two-dimensional Ising model, which is uh, uh, which is uh, a kind of nearest neighbor interaction model in two dimensions. And for this one, I mean, there's surprisingly little work has been done on this uh, in the literature we found for the quantum system. And, uh, and essentially what you do, you see that the, the J is there. I'm encoding a, a two-dimensional lattice in, in terms of I hats and J hats are labeling the lattice positions. And, uh, and uh, you just have nearest neighbor interactions. So if the, if the squares are next to each other, there's an interaction in the Js and otherwise, there isn't, and the typical behavior you see on the left when you reduce the temperature is very similarly recreated on the right when you reduce uh, one over square root lambda. So the overall scaling of the Hamiltonian in the quantum annealer makes it behave very similarly to the normal two-dimensional Ising model and you get a phase transition. And people have, um, people have uh, analyzed this in, to some extent, but not very much in the literature. So, uh, as, but you do see things, for example, when I plot uh, magnetization per qubit against uh, energy, uh, uh, magnetization per, per qubit against temperature or one over square root lambda, you see uh, it is doing a very good impression of a phase transition, this system, and, uh, and sort of basically full quantitative studies remain to be done. I mean, there's some work that's been done by uh, Zurich and collaborators, but uh, it's, it certainly looks as if it's behaving in the right sort of way. What we do um, is we use this sort of analysis in order to inform our anneal schedules. So when we choose our anneal parameters, we use uh, the results of this sort of study. So anyway, let me talk about now how we encode a landscape. We're going to be, uh, so as I said, in two dimensions, we're going to encode the two dimensions in a, a spin chain as follows. So we're following the domain wall encoding, which was actually invented by Nick Chancellor. And it's a kind of what you would call a one hot encoding of a continuous parameter. And we, we uh, do a quasi continuous uh, embedding of this parameter. So, so we choose some large number n 
in order to encode the parameter. And the and the one hot encoding is given by a domain wall position. So you see on the left there, there are negative spins up to some position R1, and then positive spins up to up to N. So that encodes one of the dimensions of the two-dimensional lattice. And then uh, the second half is given by is given to encoding the second one. And you can see that I can recreate an, a quasi-continuous parameter if I just count the number of minuses here. So that's what this uh, the, those expressions are doing for phi and psi there. So if you add up the one minus sigmas, wherever there's a minus, it will contribute to some term psi, an amount psi, to some fiducial value phi zero. And same with the second one for psi. So you see that um, that that's a, a faithful encoding. And what we have to do is we have to make sure that that is uh, going to be the only type of spin structure we see on the annealer. So we do that with with what we call uh, chain couplings. Uh, so the first one, the H, there we enforce minuses at the one and the n plus one position, and it enforces pluses at the n and two n position. And the J's are the ones which enforce just one domain wall in the system. So that's how we do it. All right, so that's how we encode something. And the usefulness of that is that essentially we can encode any um, potential that we like in two dimensions on the annealer. So we get sort of past this problem that we have where we're, it's difficult to encode something other than a quadratic on a, on a, a quadratic system. So, so now what we can do is if we want to add to this system a Hamiltonian in phi and psi, what we can do is we can, so this, this Hamiltonian will be given by that coupling. Uh, so it's couplings between sigma i plus one minus sigma i and sigma n plus j plus one minus sigma n plus j. So you see that's a coupling between phi and psi. Uh, and so all I need to do is I can then write any function of phi and psi I want and multiply that. So you see that I can I can put any function onto the annealer now, a continuous function of phi and psi. And uh, if you remember your first year calculus, it, that's equivalent to a double d, d, d by d phi, d by d psi of that potential. So that's what we put on the annealer. That's our couplings, our j's. Right, so now let's, so now it's the fun part. We can see what the the, the potentials do. So let's start with this one. So it's a corrugated potential. So that's our landscape. We encode that on the annealer. Uh, and so, and this is just a potential we picked. It looks kind of hard to find the minimum. So it's got many, many minima there. Uh, and so let's let's compare how they uh, how they do. So what I'm showing you here are the four different types of optimization algorithms. The top row uh, is the probability density, uh, essentially. So what that shows you is that, uh, for example, the Nell de Mead method, a lot of the time it will find the minimum, but also it finds all of the local minima as well. Uh, and similar for gradient descent, it's even worse actually gradient descent, if anything. Thermal annealing uh, does a reasonable job. Uh, and then you see the quantum annealing is, is Kind of best at all, but you, you see the limit there is we can only do something which is, well, at best 20 by 20 qubits. So we're limited by the number of qubits. Uh, so the bottom row, uh, what I'm showing you there is, that, so this is the mean distance from the global minimum when you start from that point in the plane. And you see that with the Nelda Mead, uh, you see that it, there's a kind of domain of attraction there. So the purple what you want is everything purple essentially everything dark blue um, and you see that you only get dark blue when you're in the domain of attraction of the global minimum already if you're outside you tend to fall into other minima so that's the green or the yellow yellow is worst gradient descent is also uh, not good so you see that you're also uh, you also fail really if you're outside the domain of attraction of a globe of a of the global minimum Thermal annealing, this is a kind of typical uh, result of thermal annealing that it's uh, so some of the time you'll find it and some of the time you won't. So you sometimes flip into the local, into the global minimum domain of attraction. Other times you kind of roll outside. So you tend to get that it's a little bit uh, sort of, uh, you know, statistical fluctuations with thermal annealing. 
quantum annealing will sort of tunnel most of the time to this minimum. So you see that quantum annealing is very efficient at finding the minimum. So now, obviously, as with physicists, we like to crank things up until they break. Um, and so, uh, so let's try, let's try the next one. Okay, my clicker doesn't work again. Oh, yes, it does. Right. Okay. Right, so, so the next one I'm going to try is a multi-well potential. And the multi-well potential is, uh, is the Tanch one, which has got uh, many minima and then, a, uh, and then a kind of plateau between them. And this one is, uh, is, is more difficult for everyone except the quantum annealer. So let me show you the same graphs again, and I'll try and speed up, obviously, because I'm running out of time now. Um, so uh, you see that the, the, the three methods, Nelda Mead, gradient descent, thermal annealing, uh, are, are quite poor. They're all quite poor at finding this global minimum, which is actually the middle one. Um, and again, you see the thermal annealing is kind of uh, slightly statistical fluctuation, but it doesn't really do very well. Most of the time it fails. The quantum annealing uh, there, you see that, that everywhere, it doesn't matter where you start, you will always find the minimum. The thermal annealing, it, it looks better than it is actually on the top line, because what happens a lot of the time is, it, is that you will fall to the edge. So a lot of the solutions will actually be on the edge of this diagram. So now let me show you the worst. I've nearly finished. So I'll show you the worst of the uh, potentials you can possibly imagine. And this was one which was uh, which is typical to analyze and when you're thinking of the classical, uh, when you're looking at the classical systems and classical minimization algorithms. So this one is uh, it's, it's one of the most difficult things you can imagine with the classical one. So there's a, it's kind of volcano. So there's a hump and then, then there's a deep minimum. Uh, and you want to find that deep global minimum. And this is how they do. So you see that the Nelda Mead is very bad. And also the gradient descent almost never finds it unless you're already in the hole. Unless you're already in the hole. Thermal annealing, uh, it will find it. But again, it looks better than it is. Because again, a lot of them fall to the outside. So you don't actually see it on the top row. Uh, on the top diagram, the bottom diagram, you uh, you see that it, it's kind of, uh, you know, again, it's statistical, but you do get there every so often. Quantum annealing, again, will take you to the minimum fairly efficiently. Um, so just in case you're wondering whether it's an effect of uh, uh, having had, having chosen a 20 by 20 grid for the quantum annealing, are we favoring somehow the quantum annealer? versus the other thing. So this is now comparing thermal annealing on a 20 by 20 grid, quantum annealing on a 30 by 30 grid. And, and you see again, quantum annealing is, is better at finding a minimum, it's much better. Right, so let me conclude. Uh, so um, so we've, we've carried out a comparative study of quantum annealers uh, versus classical optimization methods. And generally we find it very promising. I mean, I don't like to, use words like advantage or supremacy, which are politically loaded. Uh, but certainly, uh, I, I kind of leave it up to you to decide. But, but for me, it's a very promising tool uh, for minimizing uh, problems, especially problems with continuous, uh, continuous variables, which we may be facing, and also complex, complex parameter spaces and things like that. Right. Okay, thank you.